Yay. Also, you're the first person to be on my show, which Woo! is awesome. It's like, I'm, it's like I'm excited. <laughs> I'm, I, I am fantastically honored to, to be the number one guest in the, the rebranding. It's, uh, yeah. it's very excited, very thrilling. And I know when you first start a podcast, uh, it could be a little intimidating, even if it is the second time around. So having those first, a handful of guests that you know, and you're familiar with, mm -hmm. um, only, it, it only adds a very strong foundation to the, to the show that you're going to build. Yeah. I'm, I'm so excited for it. So thank you again <laughs> for doing this with me. So let's get started. This is my first intro. How do I do this? <laughs> <laughs> hey everyone, welcome to 30 Flirty and Nerdy. I have here with me Jake Gallen. He is the person that I know from podcasting a long time ago. He was on my other podcasting show about his podcast, The Guest List, which is now the Jake Gallon podcast. And he does everything about like NFTs, crypto, investing, any money related type of topic. And the reason why I wanted Jake on here is because he, I don't know any of that stuff. Like I'm 30, don't know anything about like investing. I never invested before, never did any of that before. So I thought it'd be great to have Jake come on and kind of walk me through it and walk you guys through it too so you could kind of have an idea about where to start if you've never done it and you're 30 and you're like oh shit what do we do so again welcome to the podcast jake <laughs> hi juliana i'm more than honored to be the first guest uh, to see a familiar face same same person different show but probably similar conversations um mm -hmm. just now i now i think we're almost two years removed from that first episode or maybe about a year and a half. So time has yeah. been flying. We've grown. Uh, my show's now over 200 episodes since that time. And I think we're both a little bit more prepared and not as afraid <laughs> or nervous uh, on the mic as, as we were before. Yeah, exactly. Because I remember I was so nervous. I didn't even show my face the first time I was talking to you. I was like, no, I can't do it. But now I'm like, yeah, I've done it before. I've talked to so many different people. Like, I've grown and I'm also like doing podcast managing still. So just being in the space for about that long, like almost two years, that's wild to me. You said that I was like, wow, was it really that long ago? But yeah, it's great. It's, it's going to be good. So I'm just really excited to get started. And the first question I guess I should start off with is like, what the heck is crypto? Like what, what is it? I hear it around so many times we were like, oh, they're talking about crypto again. I know in some type form of money like online money, but I don't know the, like behind the scenes, I don't know anything about it. So what is crypto in your terms? Well, after being in it daily, 24 seven for the last five and a half, almost six years, I think I'm still trying to figure out that question as well. Crypto is ultimately it's digital scarcity. It's a form of money. It's a form of ownership. It's a form of, of intellectual, intellectual expression. There's a lot of, there's a handful of ways that you could go about it. It's just completely internet native currency. If you really, if you believe in a digital future that human society is going to progress and spend more time online in this digital economy, whether you're playing video games or doing podcasts or putting content on YouTube, we increasingly spend more time. I, I just, today, Sunday is recording. I got my, my iPhone update of the amount of screen time that I spent daily this week. And it was almost 10 hours. And you know, a lot of that time isn't actually consumption, it's production from, from putting out content, from podcasts, from investing strategies and, and, and doom scrolling Twitter is definitely a, a big component of that. So if, if our generation millennials and, and lower are going to live most of our lives on the internet, then we need to have a digitally native currency that's out of control of governments and that the people have control over. And so that's exactly what Bitcoin is. Bitcoin's kind of like the gold of the internet. And then you go into things like smart contracts, which is like Ethereum and Solana, some of these other ones. Think of it as like a, uh, an iOS or a Windows where instead of having Apple gate the, the app store where you have to go through their controls. And then also in the app store, you have to fork out 30% of your profits to, to Apple just to sit in their app store. So things like Ethereum empower creators to go upload apps to this decentralized 
a smart contract system, which is equivalent to like a Windows or iOS for essentially just gas fees. At the time, there's no intermediary. So you're basically cutting out all the middlemen. And then you go down to NFTs, which are the hot topic, right? People are trading eight pictures for, for millions of dollars. There's pixelated pictures. People sold a $69 million picture. NFTs are the hot topic, a hot trend. I think it's pushed more to, to retail. So it, people like us, instead of like institutions, like, like banks and, and universities and hedge funds and things like that, that have large amounts of money. NFTs represent pretty much everything in the world, just digitized. So if you know the idea of like what fungibility is versus non-fungibility, fungibility, right? Most people don't. Fungibility is just a primarily used for currency. So if you and I both had, if we're going to go make it rain at the club, right? We all have $1 bills, right? We each have a thousand one dollars bills and we throw them up in the air. Now we have $2,001 bills on the ground. You could take any $1 bill off the ground and it has the same exact value. So that's fungibility. You can replace something within a set and there, there's no change in, in value. Non-fungibility is pretty much everything else. Humans are non-fungible. Even dollar, some dollar bills can claim to be non-fungible because they have a serial number. So they're all unique. So it's just unique, it's unique items, unique, unique humans, anything unique in the world is non-fungible. So now you take that to the, the, the internet and you have to prove that you own things on the internet. So that's what an NFT is. It's just a digital ownership. So for example, the, the most popular example of this is like Fortnite. Are you familiar with what Fortnite is? So Fortnite, if you play video games, there's things called skins, right? Wearables, or you have weapons or different things like that. Those are all individual NFTs from the, the skin that you wear in a Fortnite to the gun that you have in Call of Duty to to the land that, that you uh, sit on and own in the Sims. But the thing about that is that those, those items in each individual game is owned by the game developers, right? They could come in, the guy who created Ethereum, his name is Vitalik Buterin. His infamous story of why he created Ethereum is because he spent, he said half of his life leveling up some sort of warlock or character inside World of Warcraft. And some, there was some sort of rules violation. And I think it's Activision that owns World of Warcraft repossessed his warlock after spending six years of, of his life or seven years at the time. So he realized that they need to have some sort of independent ownership. So that's exactly what NFTs were. If his warlock was an NFT, then Activision couldn't come in and repossess it from him because essentially he has the password to that warlock and not Activision who has password or the keys, we call it keys in crypto to every item within the individual game. So that's kind of the, the, the explanation of those three, if it makes sense, but crypto is it's open source. So anyone can contribute at any time and that's what makes it so chaotic. Hmm. Okay. So it's kind of like you create something on the internet and you sell it and you get as much, like you get money back. That's like more money than you think you can. Make. Yeah. You, yeah. You can't, you can attach a market to anything. Okay. Uh, another example uses, uh, on the internet. NFTs are have been really good for meme creators and photographers. Mm -hmm. And the reason is that if somebody creates a meme, once, once it hits the internet, it's repurposed thousands or even millions of times like Pepe the Frog, right? It was a, a creation of uh, Matt Fury. And then now Pepe the Frog is pretty much the Mickey Mouse of the internet. So whoever creates that meme, that Pepe the Frog meme, usually before crypto and NFTs, they put a little watermark inside the picture, right? You put your little name, it's like faint so that if anyone screenshots it, you could prove that you're the one that created it. But now with Photoshop, it's easy to like get rid of a lot of those watermarks. So people can just take credit of others work with NFTs. You could take the image or whatever it is you're doing, any sort of data set file. It could be an MP3, it could be an MP4, it could be a JPEG, PNG, so on and so forth. You basically mint it into the blockchain, which is just like a, a spreadsheet. So think of like a Google spreadsheet that anybody can access at any point in time. So you can see every single transaction that's ever existed. I create a Pepe the Frog meme. I'll call it the Denver Broncos Pepe because I'm a Broncos fan. I can now put that, create that meme, mint it as an NFT on the blockchain. And anytime that resurfaces, people know that I'm the person that created it because I'm the one that has the earliest timestamp, which adds provenance. Okay. Cause I was hearing like, and with NFTs, people could like copy and steal your work. Like I know an artist who was thinking about doing NFTs, right. But they're worried that they're gonna, their stuff is going to be stolen and like, you know, done over and over and over again. But with, with that digital blueprint, they will get the most 
reward from that piece of work, but everyone else won't because it's kind of like not legitimately theirs. Is that right? Is there like a type of code? There's def- yeah, yeah. There, it's called your keys. Uh, so oh, your private okay. keys is, is, is the equivalent of the password. So okay. if you have the private keys to that NFT, then you're the one that has access. And you can also tie in royalties at any time it's used. And what, where a lot of the confusion comes from is uh, there's this distinction of Web 2 versus Web 3. I don't know if you've heard that, that kind of idea. Web 2 is uh, centralized, uh, centralized data providers. So think of like Google, Facebook, Netflix, right? They own every individual's data that's in, that uses their, their platform, right? Because they, they have the central data storages. They have the central servers stored somewhere. With, with blockchain and crypto and Web3, the data is all stored on the blockchain, which can be audited at any point by any individual at any time. So essentially, you're giving the data back to the individuals and back to the creators. And it helps empower them because you could tie royalties in. And now with, with your own data, there's a lot of things you could do. You can sell it if you want, or you can be an, a private individual. You can be anonymous. There's a, a lot of ways to go about it. And of course, there's a lot of nuance to it and it's still very early. But when you can, when you start understanding the technology first and then the financial component that comes second, I think you'll have a, a much, much more frictionless experience uh, navigating the wild west of crypto than it was to try to understand the financial component first and then the technology second. Because of course, it's going to be intimidating when you see monkey pictures that look like a five-year-old maid selling for millions of dollars. But if you, if you understand the technology and the culture too, then it makes the financial component easier to understand. Okay. So let me try and wrap my head around this. There's crypto, which is the umbrella term. And then there's NFTs, Bitcoin, and then like all the other ones underneath that. NFT is kind of like at the bottom, but it's starting to like come up. It's kind of like one of the last ones I think I know. Um, and it's all like a digital blueprint and NFTs is you ha- do like art, music, anything, and you have a blueprint under it and you can make royalty income that way. So like, like my other question is people that do TikTok sounds, are they getting like thousands and thousands of dollars that because they have like put an NFT on it or something like that? You know, does that make sense? Like, are they, are they able to get like rewarded for that sound instead of it being, you know, just repeated over and over again? Is that kind of like why TikTok and like things like that are becoming so big and popular now. So TikTok has mentioned that they're navigating NFTs to find what the, the right blueprint is for, for their model because they are operating off of Web2 infrastructure. Uh, okay. So it's more of like tying small nuances or small, small products into their Web2 product. That'll make it work sense. So there, there's a, a world, and I'll share this for a second. There's a world famous DJ, his name's uh, Justin Blau. He lives here in Las Vegas. Uh, he goes by 3LAU, world famous DJs at EDC and stuff. He created a, a company called Royal. Uh, Royal is for music royalty services. And the basic idea is that if you're a, uh, a music provider, there's a chain smokers have, have done some stuff with him, Jay-Z and a few other people. You can take 50% or whatever percentage of a song that you, that you produce and skip the agencies who generally take about 50% of all your profits. And you can, what he did is the first song called Worst Case that he put on there. He, he divided 50% of the royalties forever in perpetuity into about 300 NFTs. And then those 300 NFTs ep- represent a percentage of ownership in that song. And right now they're still working out the legal framework, but the idea is in the future, anytime anybody wants to use that song, whether it's another DJ or, or it's going to be put in a movie or the royalties from the streaming software or streaming software platforms, all of that goes back to the NFT token holders. And so, and then it becomes a more intimate relationship with the artist because now you're going, now you're taking your music and your artistry and you're going directly to your audience rather than having to go through an agency who then signs you up and puts you in, in, a in magazines and, and on stage at EDC and all these different things. And so it's the very early stages, but that's the kind of things that you can do. And I think that's why NFTs are a perfect fit for the creator economy is where it's where we hang out. If you're a YouTuber, if you're a, a physical artist who, who has the ability to uh, transcribe it digitally, musical artist, actor, people are uh, comedians and anything that has some sort of IP attachment to it, I would highly advise to look into NFTs, especially this early, because there's maybe a million people participating in the entire world in this right now. Yeah. So it's very, very new. 
Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, NFTs have actually been around for about 10 years, but they recently blew up within the last year and a half or so, especially during the, the pandemic times when everyone was sitting around on the computer and uh, all this money existed and was printed. And so there was a lot of speculation and of course, uh, human psychology is that wherever money gravitates towards, it's associated with power and then people become interested and becomes this like giant feedback loop. Okay, so I kind of had a light bulb moment. <laughs> NFTs is like a trademark for creatives, is that right? Yeah. But you're getting yeah. money brought in with it instead of putting money out for it. Okay, that makes so much more sense. So I'm like, it's kind of like a trademark, like you're trademarking, putting a digital blueprint on your creative process and on your creative work. Yeah, and and, and, and you could theorize like in the future, if you've ever seen their movie, Ready Player One, right? We're in this VR yeah. experience. Yes. If you're living in this VR experience, which we think we're headed, it's probably a lot farther away than we think. But how do you prove that you own this virtual house that you live in, right? Is is ever is the data stored of your ownership going to be inside Facebook servers, or is it going to be on a public blockchain where anybody can audit it and see all of the transactions? It eliminates all of the the like backroom deals and all of the closed door conversations that uh, is Jen has stayed hidden away from from civilization for forever so it's it's trying to create more transparency of course then in this like digital world that you think about it does become more susceptible to, to scammers and manipulation and especially when there's it's a new technology not everyone completely understands what's there and it's still trying to get worked out so it is a double-edged sword because now the dark markets or whoever also has the opportunity to participate on an even playing field as the average uh, individual does. So it, it, it does go both ways and there's a lot of ways to kind of figure it out. But to us, I would rather live in a digital world and spend my time in the creator economy where I know all my data cannot be manipulated by the government or by any sort of corporation or organization that I'm not favorable towards. It's just a completely community owned economy. Okay, interesting. Yeah, so it's basically, like you said before, going into more digital world, like Ready Player One, which makes sense because I saw that movie and it's crazy. I'm like, will we ever like get to live in that type of reality? And it seems like with like NFTs and cryptos and things like that, it's leaning towards that. You know, you just kind of put on your, what do they call it? You put on a thinking cap or you put on your VR headset? Yeah, VR headset and you just kind of like escape into this other world. It's kind of crazy. Like we could get into all that, like in a whole another topic. It's, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's insane. But okay, that makes, it's starting to like click for me more. And I guess my other question though for you is how does one get started? I know it's probably like opening a can of worms, but like mm -hmm. say like I want to invest in like Bitcoin. You know, I've been seeing a lot of people being like, oh, I got you know, $20,000 in like three days, like just by putting in 400, this is how you could do it too. Like I see people do like coaching, like it just seems too good to be true. You know what I mean? Like, it seems like you've got $2,000 in two days just by putting in like what, 400, like how does that make sense? You know, like how yeah, does that, 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 that growth, the, that way to, um, multiply your capital exponentially comes generally from altcoins. Those who got into Bitcoin very early, like when I got into Bitcoin, Bitcoin was th around $1,300. Uh, there's people who got in with Bitcoin around a dollar or $10. And it, it has to do with supply and demand and also digital scarcity. Like Bitcoin, there's only going to ever be 21 million. So if there's a small supply, it, early, in the early days, it was very volatile because there weren't many coins or many participants and it's easy to sway markets. The, a lot of those returns with Bitcoin are pretty much gone. Now you have about 200 million people in the world that own Bitcoin. And so we're still kind of in this early adopter phase, which is generally about, or, or you could say the early majority between 15, we're between the 15 and 50% adoption of the, the globe within crypto. I always advise starting with a very strong foundation. So the first thing I say is go all the way back to start and read the white paper by Satoshi Nakamoto, which is the pseudonymous creator of Bitcoin. It's no one knows who the actual creator is. It's nine pages and there is some technical terms to it, but if you understand how Bitcoin works and research some of the terminology in there, then you'll be able to understand everything. When you understand that Bitcoin is going to be this digital store of value, it's essentially gold. So if you understand how gold works in a, in a financial system in modern society, 
then you're able to understand how stocks work and how other commodities like oil works and then what risk on assets are and risk off and and then you start understanding then the financial tools are built upon it but if you understand what a store of value is then it makes it much easier to comprehend all of these other things that are built on top of it and so just think of that and then you can start having those relations of the things that exist in web 2 which is i just call that it's like today today's society the non-digital world is just being replicated and optimized in web 3 so Go start, go read the white paper. Um, you can also go go watch a handful of good Bitcoin documentaries if you're uh, more of a visual learner than you are somebody who likes to read uh, read text and, and literature and uh, like scientific papers. Those are the best two starts. And then from there, go to Ethereum, look up Vitalik Buterin, who's the founder, uh, read his story, and then kind of understand the idea of, of smart contracts. And what that means, where it's basically you're just replacing anything, any intermediary that exists today is going to be re replaced by a smart contract and not completely eliminated. It'll just be uh, a second option in that. So think of lawyers, any sort of financial institution, you know, a lot of apps, right? Air, like Airbnb and Uber, um, a lot of the uh, social media platforms, there will be a Web3 alternative of that in the future where it's just you and I, like, let's say I'm an Uber driver. I just go onto the decentralized Uber app and then I can get picked up by Juliana and there's no, and then Uber, since it doesn't exist and it's a peer to peer network, I'm saving money and the driver's making more money because that commission's not coming out of my pay, out of my pay as a driver to pay Uber because they're hosting the infrastructure for that to happen. So that's the kind of things that when you start understanding those, co those concepts, then it makes it easier to invest with the different technologies. But I know it is very quite intimidating because it has now existed for about 13 years at this, or around 13 years at this time of this recording. But start with the Bitcoin white paper. And Twitter is where all of the communication is within crypto. Discord's number two, and then podcasts. You go on to YouTube, and YouTube, there's a lot of... There's a lot of manipulation, a lot of mischievous behavior, a lot of shills. So if you're going to YouTube to look at crypto, watch a lot of like how to's and explanatory videos and not a lot of the, this coin is going to 1000 X in seven days, because a lot of those people are paid chills and it's tough to, uh, make money off of those YouTube because they've already bought in and they're just showing it's for like pump and dump. So Twitter, best source of information. And then Discord is for the communities and then podcasts are my, would be my top three from a content consumption standpoint. Okay. Will you be able to send me those resources that like you go on all the time? So I can put mm -hmm. them in the show notes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think that'd be very helpful for people to kind of be like, oh, I want to like look for it, but I don't know where to look for it. I think that would be very, very helpful. For so thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. So, okay. That it's making a lot more sense. And you said how many bitcoins are there in the world and why is there only a cap number will that ever grow no so there's 21 there will be 21 million that ever exists that's based off of the 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 code that satoshi nakamoto deployed when they when they created it at the time right now there's about 19 million that exists and then there's this uh, idea called mining where the the basic idea is that in web 2 if i wanted to send juliana money right if i want to send you money through Venmo, we each have a bank where our money's stored and then it goes through Venmo um, and the payment processor, whoever v Venmo uses. So it goes through like four different companies before it ever reaches you. And they could possibly take, they could possibly take a commission out of it. And going through those trusted sources is the way that they, they verify that this transaction is real. So on the Bitcoin network and in crypto, but this is Bitcoin specifically, I send you a Bitcoin and it's the transactions masked in a it's it's encrypted in a it's called a cryptographic function which is basically means is that it's it's encrypted in code and that specialized computers solve the code to verify that it's happened and once six different bitcoin miners which are just computers solve that cryptographic function then it's put into the blockchain and it's approved as a as a real transaction and that's kind of how it happens so instead of having two banks and venmo verify our transactions in web 2 you just now have six or more computers verifying the transaction okay and so like 
where do you find the Bitcoin? Like how, like, how do you achieve that? Is there like an app? Is there a website you go on? Is there like Bitcoin.com? Like, does that make sense? Like where, where exactly do you find this money? Mm -hmm. Uh, if you're in America that I would, I always suggest starting with Coinbase. They're a publicly traded company. They're just a crypto exchange. So basically they're like the equivalent of a, of a bank in web two. Um, they, there's a little bit more nuance to it and they ha offer a little bit more, uh, functionality and, and options that a bank does, but that is the safest and trusted source as an American, I would say to purchase Bitcoin or cash app. You could do it as cash from cash app as well, who is the creator of Twitter, um, who is also Jack Dorsey has left Twitter to go pursue Bitcoin full-time. So there's a lot of a connection between Twitter and crypto. That's kind of where everything started. But if you want to buy Bitcoin, go, go, go to Cash App or Coinbase. And then I would just suggest using Coinbase to understand how a wallet works and a bunch of these other functions. And Coinbase actually pays you to learn crypto on their platform. It's called Learn to Earn, where they pay you in these different uh, crypto tokens to learn a, a bunch of the, the technology and things that come along with it. Okay, that's pretty cool. That's cool that they like pay you to learn. I like that. <laughs> That's the, that's the new model. So there's, there's these models called X to earn, play to earn, learn to earn, watch to earn, study to earn. And the idea is that the, the, the new paradigm with, with Web3 is that the more engaged you are in the network, the more you're rewarded. So there's a lot of these, these different protocols and strategies that are being practiced to see if they work. Play to earn has definitely, is definitely ahead. Uh, Mark Cuban, who owns the Mavericks, actually just created uh, his own, pl uh, he calls it a professional metaverse, which is called, uh, which is a learn to earn model, where he said that the, the college system is broken, the 40 hour work week is broken, the 30 year career path is obsolete at this point. And in order to live in this digital economy, society is going to have to be retrained, but in order to retrain nobody, most people are not going to know what their skill is and where their place is in a digital economy, right? Are you, are you a dev? Are you somebody who is, you know, a digital artist in the metaverse? Are you an architect? All of these. So there's these different things in his metaverse that he pays you to learn these different skills that are only applicable in this digital economy. So those are, there's like a bunch of different experiments that are going on. That's really cool. I think that's amazing. Everything that you said is making so much more sense. And I can't wait for you to send me those resources so I could kind of like dig through deeper. The one last question I think I could ask you is if you could give yourself one piece of advice to your younger self about being 30 and about, you know, crypto and all of that, what would that advice be? Don't be afraid to be aggressive. I, I definitely was aggressive in many ways in my life, even outside of crypto in terms of socializing and partying and investing and all of these different things. But there were a lot of decisions that I look back on and think, man, I should just pull the trigger to see what happens. Sometimes you're afraid to take that leap of faith, but especially when you're, when you're younger and in your twenties and even specifically your early twenties, there's a lot of room to make mistakes and you should be okay with making mistakes because that's how you learn and improve uh, your life. And your early twenties should be for making a lot of money, losing a lot, a lot of money, but being able to kind of refine uh, your strategy and figure out what is the best, what are the best tools that you could utilize to have a successful career and what interests you the most. I, I personally traded, I I've been in crypto for five years, but I've, I've started two businesses. I've tried to write a book, started a podcast, created YouTube content, graduated from college, made a lot of dumb mistakes, went sober for three years, worked at a nightclub in Vegas. So I've kind of like done a lot of things in my 20 to experiment and see what interests me. What did I really like? And at the end of the day, entrepreneurship is, is kind of what really captured my attention. And then crypto is what captured my intellectual creativity. I didn't think I was a creative person. I was associated uh, creativity with physical expressions, like, like, uh, artistry of some sort, or even like musical, but I never thought that brain power could be creative. And then I learned that creating businesses or articulating ideas, having conversations like this, and then in crypto, that's become extrapolated many magnitudes more to creating all kinds of weird, crazy concepts and the financialization of just normal activities that I would have never been able to, to comprehend until I actually just 
took the leap of faith and went into crypto full time. And now I've been doing it full time without a job for over two years. Then I look back and think this is the best decision ever. Why didn't I do this earlier? So just, just be very fearless in your youth because there's so many opportunities out there, especially in this digital economy, just really pursue getting your time back and living life on your own terms. I know some people like organization, but it's going to be a slow process. The podcast that I've been doing now is going on two years. And if you go back to my first few episodes, man, I awful, awful, very monotone, very frightened, didn't know social cues, charisma, body language, a lot of these things that I was very unaware of. And I would have never been able to get to the position I am today without just doing it, like Nike says. So it's one of the best quotes that I think anyone can follow. I love that. Thank you so, so much. I think people are definitely going to learn a lot from this episode and learn a lot from you and just learn to take risks, like you said, and (laughs) take risks and just be fearless. So I think that's awesome. Thank you so much. No, thank thank you, Juliana. I I really appreciate this. Best of luck with the the rest of the podcast. Uh, I'm definitely a listener and a viewer, and I'm here to to support you along your journey. And for all the viewers, uh, my name is Jake Allen. You can find me at jakeallen.com is where all my Twitter, YouTube podcasts, all that stuff's on there. So it's easy. If you have any crypto questions, feel free to reach out. Or if you live out in Vegas, same exact thing. I'm I'm always available at some point during the day. And this, <laughs> I guess, is a little bit of a disclaimer. So yeah, thank you again for this opportunity. Of course. Thank you so much. Hey friends, thank you for listening to today's episode. Please take a moment to follow and review this podcast so it could reach others. Also, if you leave a review, I'll be sharing your review in the next episode. Lastly, if you want to be part of this growing podcast to chat about your life, your profession, passions, or if you have advice that you wish you had at 30, please sign up at the link provided in the show notes. I would love to have you as a guest on the show. Thank you so much for listening and I hope you have a wonderful day. 